Hello everyone, thank you for coming to this, our fifth linkage webinar, um, continuing the theme of gene targeted therapies. My name is Hassan, I spoke a couple of webinars ago and I, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sam Bajati. I've known Dr. Bajati for coming up to eight years now since I did my paediatrics rotation in clinical school um, and Dr. Bajati works as a consultant paediatric oncologist at Adam Brooks in Cambridge, but on top of that, he is also a group leader at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute in Hingston, just outside of Cambridge. He works across a number of things, including sort of cancer cell genetics and sort of more um, sort of cellular modeling. Um, and he's recently won quite a few big awards, um, to name a few, the Ambo Young Investigator Award and the Pest Collar Foundation EACR Rising Star Award. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Bajati for this, our fifth linkage webinar. Oh, thank you, Hassan, for this very kind introduction. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm quite excited to be able to uh, talk to you today. What I'm going to do, I will mainly speak about the clinical whole genome sequencing service of childhood cancer, which I thought might be, might be of interest to the audience. And, and then not really dabble much into my research. But um, as we go uh, through this presentation, I'll make the, the odd reference. Next slide, please. So I'll um, start all of this with an introduction going back quite a few years. So let me, and our oh, wonderful Elliot Nick and uh, next slide. So the fundamental premise of whole genome sequencing of, of any cancer is that cancer is a disease of the genome. And what we mean by that is that every cancer is caused by mutations. There is no cancer that is not caused by mutations. That's sort of true almost everywhere we look. There are sort of a few exceptions, but the few exceptions, uh, for the few exceptions, it is unclear whether they're truly exceptions or just a technical issue. So that fundamental premise that any uh, any cancer cell at its core has got a mutation or several mutations that transform the normal cell into a cancer cell is probably universally true. Next slide, please. And I'll, I'll, I'll garnish sort of my talk with the, with the odd picture. And what I'm showing you here in the background is a, a circus plot, which I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with. It's a way of representing a, a genome and rather than having a linear copy number plot, we look at a circular structure and this particular one is from what's really quite a seminal paper by Peter Campbell from over 10 years ago now, where he described this shattering of chromosomes called chromatrypsis. Next slide, please. Now, because cancer is a disease of the genome, one might suggest that if we, we understood the mutations that cause cancer, perhaps there could be something useful in it, either, either from a fundamental cancer research point of view, or for patients. And this then goes to, to a discovery like this, and I've put this one up. The first one probably, I mean, well, certainly is BCI able, but that's a slightly different kettle of fish. This BRAF B600E mutation um, that, that I'm alluding to here, this is a paper by Helen Davies, which was published in 2002 from Sanger at the Cancer Genome Project at the time. This particular gene and this particular mutation sort of mar marks the beginning of precision oncology and this idea that maybe we could treat patients by targeting their mutations. Uh, next slide, please. And the significance of this BRAF V600 mutation is that it is the first point mutation for which a specific drug was developed, Vemurafenib. It was at the time the, the discovery was made uh, in, in melanoma, and using this drug, one can actually induce remissions, complete remissions in patients with metastatic melanoma. However, melanomas are, are very clever, and I'll talk about that uh, a bit later. And, and invariably, not everybody, but almost all patients do then unfortunately relapse because of resistance mutations. However, um, and in the context of being a pediatric oncologist, perhaps I should add that BRAF is, well, the BRAF E600 e mutation is one of our favorite mutations because quite a lot of the very rare diseases that we treat for, for one reason or the other, end up being driven by BRAF E600 e mutation. So Bevorafenib is a drug that we commonly use in our, in our own practice. Next, uh, next slide, please. So 
all, all of this then leads to this fundamental idea, therefore we might be able to extract clinically meaningful information from a patient's cancer genome. Next slide, please. Now, this idea of sequencing a, a cancer in its entirety in a clinical setting, in a meaningful time frame, would have been ridiculous 20 years ago, in, in fact, unthinkable. And it's quite remarkable how, how things have changed over a very short period of time. So if we sort of think that in the early 2000s, we got the first draft of the human genome. Next slide, please. And then there was a period of about sort of seven to 10 years where, where mainly the Sanger Institute and the other place that, that did it was Johns Hopkins and to a lesser extent the Broad Institute started systematically looking at cancers and trying to find cancer mutations. However, because that was done by Sanger sequencing, which is a, is a non high throughput way of doing it, it was an unbiased whole genome sequencing and those efforts very much depended on people drawing up genes of lists that they thought might be of interest. And that BRAF discovery is a very good example of that. That was made by, by screening cell lines by capillary sequencing. And the genes that, that the team at the time looked for was based on a list that the, the senior author Andy Futrial drew up. And he is, he's a man who's got vast biological knowledge and kind of thought, well, I think BRAF might be a cancer gene. And of course, right, he was. Next slide, please. And the game changer in all of this, and I'm sure you're all very well aware, is next generation sequencing. But even that is, is, is again, uh, extraordinary to, to reflect upon. So when I did my PhD, was, which was 2011 to 2014, I remember getting my first genome in 2000, my first cancer genome in 2011. And, and it was, you know, such a wonderful and beautiful and extraordinary moment. That, that thing had 30x coverage. The data was a bit ropey. It cost £10,000. And even then, the idea that now in the NHS, I could, as a clinical test, just request a whole genome of, of, a, of a child's cancer seemed, seemed quite unbelievable. And it's really beautiful uh, uh, to consider that we are able to do that. Next slide, please. So whole genome sequencing or DNA readouts of cancers probably have to contribute. Well, we do know they have something to contribute across the entire practice of, of, of oncology. However, actually, it, it seems to be particularly useful in pediatric oncology. Next slide, please. And the main reason for that is that childhood cancer pediatric oncological practice comprises a bunch of really very rare, very unusual, in part not really well explained tumours. So we've got a sort of few standard things, but within our standard things, most tumours are a, a little strange, and then we get entities that we know really very little about, and, and therefore, by definition, almost we are likely to, to benefit from sequencing these tumours. Next slide, please. And by contrast, adult epithelial cancer, they're, they're very important, and you could think of them as a, you know, a, a, a field of, of cattle, of, uh, um, of, of cows, of, of different strains. They're really important, they're, they're, they're fundamental of course, and 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 um, and so forth. However, at their core, they are reasonably homogenous. Of course, there are different variations of epithelial cancers, but the spectrum of diseases that that uh, uh, adults are um, uh, uh, cancers that adults get are quite limited compared to what what we deal with. Next slide, please. Um, so. The other reason why it is probably particularly beneficial to look for mutations that we can target in childhood cancer is the very low mutation burden. What I'm showing you here is, is another plot from probably most, most, one of the most seminal papers in cancer genomics. This is a piece of work by, by Mike Stratton and his PhD student Ale uh, Ludmila Alexandrov, where they teased out mutational signatures, which I'm sure you've heard about uh, a lot. That's This slide is not about mutation signatures, it's about burdens. So on the y-axis is a mutation burden expressed as, as the amount of mutation per megabase of genome and then all the different entities. And what you can see is on the far left are pediatric entities that have got a very, very modest mutation burden compared to adult cancers. This is a logarithmic scale. But of course, the reason is because these are non-epithelial cancers, they're not caused by mutagen exposure or old age and therefore they have very modest mutation burdens. But what that means in terms of treatment is this. If you consider a lung cancer in an adult, which is caused by smoking, an average lung cancer has about, you know, 
60, 70, 80,000 substitutions. Extraordinary numbers. By contrast, a bulk standard, you know, childhood leukemia has 100 or 200 substitutions. Now, within that lung cancer, with 100,000 substitution at its trunk, and that means those mutations are present in all cancer cells, every single cell will have additional private mutations. So in any lung cancer, one could do the math, let's say that it's made up of a billion cells, one would end up having every mutation known to, uh, known to man present. And therefore, it is perhaps unsurprising that precision agents, mutation target, uh, mutation uh, guided treatments in adult oncology are almost invariably always short lived in terms of their response. There are really no, not very many examples of inducing durable responses to mutation guided treatments because invariably a resistance mutation will be present in amongst that pool of highly mutated diverse cells within an adult cancer. By contrast, in children, the mutation burden is very modest, and that means that in principle, a priori, it should be feasible to target a mutation without having the possibility or the invariable possibility of a resistance mutation already present. Next slide, please. Another reason why childhood cancer is, um, uh, is, uh, is particularly likely to benefit from sequencing is the great contribution that um, germline predispositions make. So we think that a number of studies, and they've all got their own funny biases, but we reckon that in about 10% of children, there are pathogenic germline mutation, uh, uh, germline mutations present. Most of the time, without obvious stigmata of, 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 of a uh, pathogenic germline mutation, and therefore, we depend on, on unbiased sequencing to some degree to reveal these. Um, and there is no easier way of doing that than whole genome sequencing. And next slide, please. And the other reason why childhood cancer is likely to benefit from DNA sequencing, like no other, like compared to adult cancers, is that we already use a whole bunch of molecular markers for risk stratification. So the way we treat leukemia depends on cytogenetics. The way we treat neoblastoma depends on specific somatic genetic features, the same as the rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma and so forth. So because we are already in our treatment guided by genetic changes, it is likely that a readout of those genetic changes uh, uh, will help us further treat children. Next slide, please. So all of these are obviously theoretical conceptual considerations. The question that Monko put out there, does whole genome sequencing of childhood cancers actually help patients? Next slide, please. Um, we've got, there are sort of reports out there from, from various centers, including from our own, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. There is, these are three studies that came out yesterday. The top one from, from Sick Kids in Canada, the middle one from MSKCC, and the bottom from, from St. Jude's. So these are clinical sequencing efforts that deployed a variety of strategies, whole genome sequencing with or without exome, with or without transcriptome, with or without, uh, with or without target sequencing, methylation arrays, and, and you know, this whole sort of spectrum of various assays, which are all at the core had whole genome sequencing. And they, they all report in different ways that they, uh, they, uh, that they report evidence that whole genome sequencing of, of uh, cancer does help uh, treat children better. Next slide, please. What you notice about those efforts is that they're all single institution efforts, and those efforts haven't grown out of nowhere. They have grown out of pre-existing academic efforts. So there were already DNA cancer sequencing projects underway, and they sort of naturally evolved into into clinical whole genome sequencing projects. What the NHS has done is, is different, and actually I think it, it's, it's quite extraordinary, and it's the sort of thing that we should take incredible pride in. The problem with these single institution efforts is that by definition, they are inequitable, and not and you, you, have, you may have access to, to whole genome sequencing if you present to that center, but another one, and even within that center, it may depend on your insurance policy, but of course, the strategy that we have chosen here in, in England is to provide decentralized whole genome sequencing through a slightly complicated pathway, which, however, is incredibly efficient 
and very, very successful. And again, I just like to highlight, it's just phenomenal that I can. So just, uh, uh, in fact, two days ago, I had a new patient who underwent a biopsy today. And two days ago, I got uh, I asked parents for, for, for the permission to do whole genome sequence and, and I can just request the test. And I know that the data will be back in two or three weeks time. So next slide, please. Um, you, you, you are all very well aware of how the genomics laboratory hubs work. What I wanted to sort of perhaps highlight here that you may not be aware of how pediatric oncology, oncology services are arranged in the UK. So across the United Kingdom, we've, we've got 20 different centres and um, uh, 20 different primary treatment centres. So these are the centres that are allowed to treat children with cancer. They are geographically sort of reasonably rationally distributed uh, around the country. There's sort of some, some legacy uh, uh, clusters, but uh, it sort of all works really quite well. And then if we superimpose the, the GLH structure, our East uh, GLH will be Cambridge, Nottingham and Leicester. Next slide, please. And what I'll talk about a little bit is our, our service here in Cambridge. Um, next slide. And the next slide. So what we do here in Cambridge is we approach children and their families at diagnosis. The discussion about whole genome sequencing is now incorporated into our routine initial chat. So we have an awful lot of ground to cover with parents and it's, it's very difficult to empathize with, with parents because this is just unimaginable to all of us. So we sit down, we, we, we explain that their child has cancer, we, we explain to them you know, that arduous journey that lies ahead of them. And as part of that discussion, we discuss what obviously treatment, what trials there might be available. And then one aspect that we cover is, and you know, we can also offer you whole genome sequencing. You may want to choose to have that. These are the issues uh, with it. And, and parents almost invariably say, yes, we have now had in and amongst the overall experience is probably if we lump oncology and hematology together about 200 uh, families and amongst 200 families, one family said no. And that of course is, is, is perfectly fine and actually really good to see that um, the general public seems to have a very good understanding of what it means, if, if one puts it in the right words, to, to discover a, a mutation that may be running in the family. And, and that's really, really quite wonderful to see, but there is great appreciation of it. And we have had patients who have come to us and said, Oh, you know, we've heard about sequencing. I hope you're doing that for my child. And there's just a little nuance here. Sometimes we struggle with germline samples because of the when we give chemotherapy, counts go up and down. So we need to think about the logistics. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the time for discussion with family is is highly variable. Most of the time, it's a very straightforward discussion. We discuss our patients, the molecular findings. Um, at our MDTs, which happen weekly, our molecular MDTs, we sort of sometimes we talk an awful lot. So we could probably be more efficient, but we quite enjoy it. So we'll talk about two to three patients a week. We feed back to families, both verbally, but also then in writing. It's not that easy to implicate because we need fresh samples. We are very, very fortunate in Cambridge. We have got a pathology service uh, 24 7. So even if a sample was taken out of hours, um, there would be someone around to process it and preserve it for sequencing. It has got implications for surgery, so we had to, to discuss with our surgical services for all the different subspecialty that might do biopsy about our requirement for fresh samples. And one thing that seems to have happened is that we are a lot more thoughtful about where we take the biopsy from and where we might be getting the best biopsy from. And, and what we're doing has got an incredible implication for clinical genetics. I mean, uh, their workload has gone gone through the roof because of the sort of stuff that we um, find. And really the takeaway message from this slide is the service implications are vast and, and across specialties in, 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 in the hospital. Next slide, please. So we haven't formally evaluated patient feedback, and I think that's something that will be really really, really uh, uh, important to do nationally, not only in our centres. And as I said, most people will uh, uh, take part. Very straightforward, uh, very straightforward discussions most of the time. And when there are concerns, of course, 
and, and again, it's really wonderful to see that there's such a good understanding in, uh, about genetics out there. Next slide, please. So what I'm going to do is share our 100K experience. So the project sort of, of what we've done our work in Cambridge came in two phases. There was a 100,000 genome project as part of which pediatrics had an entitlement of 500 genomes, I think. We, we didn't make up that quota in the end, and um, Cambridge contributed one six of cases, which I'll talk about in a moment. So that was um, whenever they finish. I've lost uh, track actually in time about that. Anyway, since the beginning of 2021, the NHS has reintroduced whole genome sequencing again, and we're now able to offer it to everybody who walks through the door. So what I'm going to talk today about is our, our appraisal of the 100K experience, which was a theoretical appraisal in that although we did have molecular discussions and we, we, we answered the question, what have we learned from the genome? Because there was a huge delay between the project and the data, it didn't actually change patient treatment. So it was more of a retrospective analysis. However, what we are now able to do is a prospective analysis, and we are currently in the process of writing up uh, the, the first sort of year and a half, two years of experience. Next slide, please. So what I am talking about then today is that 100K cord. As I said, it was one six of the national pediatric cord, 36 children. These were non-consecutive patients, it's just so important to find out. And that's one of the weaknesses of the three papers that I showed you earlier, is that all these theories are non-consecutive patients. So the notion of whether it helps all comers, every child who walks through the door, still remains to be solved. And actually, we can uniquely in England address that question. Pediatric oncological practice in, in our world includes brain, non-brain, but also lymphoma for historical legacy reasons in, in pediatrics. Oncologists look after lymphoma rather than uh, hematologists. We look at utility in terms of diagnostic, prognostic, journal and treatment. This is based on the actual MDT discussions at the time, but the clinical impact is not in real time, as I stressed before. Next slide, please. So we, we can we can go through this and, and I'll garnish these with, with examples. So on this slide here, you see the diagnostic utility in four cases. As I said, we've got we deal with an awful lot of really strange entities that we can't define well. And then whole genome sequencing does pop up interesting things. So here on the left, you can see an, an infant who was thought to have a pilocytic uh, astrocytoma, but actually what it turned out is to be this very strange tumour with an ALK alteration, which is important because ALK is targetable. On the right hand side in the top corner, you can see that was a kid with a with a sarcoma that was undefinable at the time. And the child had done extremely, unusually, extremely well. And then retrospectively, the reason is because they had this B core rearrangement and those so children are known to do well. Um, there, there was a child with an undefinable renal tumour and, and our analysis suggested it was a worms like entity. I'll talk about the child in more detail in a moment. And in lymphoma, it's been actually that's been a repeated experience that we, we seem to be learning a lot about subclassification of uh, lymphomas. Next slide, please. And next slide. So then um, the prognostic utility. So the way we prognosticate in, in pediatrics and that then determines how intensely we treat, uh, we treat children often depends on specific genomic markers. And, and this a uh, child here that I've highlighted here was quite unusual. So they had a medulloblastoma, Sun Ketchup uh, activated medulloblastoma, which is a, is a non high risk category. However, medulloblastoma, when they have got a MECAN amplification, that then is considered high risk. So this child is uh, on conventional histology, conventional workup, and genomically, sort of superficially, had a Sun Ketchup activated medulloblastoma. But what we then found is an activating point mutation in MECAN. And that then raises a really very interesting question. So we've got MECAN, if the uh, MECAN activated, so therefore is this is this truly a non-high risk tumor, high risk tumor? And again, that's one of these sort of clinical research sort of findings that 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 we we can evaluate on. Next slide, please. Um, what we've got here, this is the, the mutation here. Next slide, please. 
And then in, in the germline, in two children here, we found something that we didn't know before. So there were quite a few children with germline mutations, but we knew about them. That's the children with back with LF1 and so forth. But there were a couple of kids where, where we had unexpected findings. And, and this one here is the most striking. This is a child in whom we found biallelic PMS2 mutations in, in the germline pathogenic mutations. And, and that's a complete game changer. That's something that wasn't known in epin to exist in ependymoma. That is not something that we would have ever looked for. And, and we found this and what that enabled us is actually for this particular child, we had the data back, thankfully, before their first relapse, which is not quite a few years ago. And the child, then we started treating with a checkpoint inhibitor and they are still doing wonderfully, beautifully well on, uh, on, on a checkpoint inhibitor in a tumor that is otherwise incurable. Um, next slide, please. And then we find a variety of, of treatment opportunities where we could use mutation-guided treatment. But actually, of all the things, it turns out that the mutations that we could target are the least interesting ones, in part because they would, we wouldn't, it would be extraordinarily rare for us to ditch conventional chemotherapy and go after a, tar uh, after a targetable mutation. And the reason is that it really is quite unjustifiable most of the time. So if I, you know, if you think about leukemia, the chance of, of curing a child with non-high-risk leukemia in this day and age is about 95%. And if with conventional chemotherapy, which is, is awful, takes two years, lots and lots of drugs, but I cannot see a well, let's say I found a BRAV E600 e mutation in, in a child with standard risk leukemia. I can't see a version of my practice where I would say, well, I'm now going to target the BRAF mutation instead of giving the treatment that I know works in 95% of children. And, and that's one of the reasons why these targetable mutations uh, are probably more interesting for us in the relapse setting or for the diseases for which we haven't got a treatment plan. And there are plenty of conditions or diseases, entities, tumor types for which there is no established treatment. And then we can we can think about these variations. So what I'll do next is I'll talk about a couple of cases in more detail, conclude with a with a little research example, and then open up the discussion. Next slide, please. Next slide. So this is quite a, a well advertised uh, case. A chap who came under our care he, when he presented with some symptoms that led to imaging and that imaging revealed a, a tumor. A kidney tumor in a 10 year old is, is quite rare. So the kidney tumors that we see are, well, most of the time it's Wilms tumor and Wilms tumor is a toddler tumor. It's not a tumor of a 10 year old. There were all sorts of odd things about this tumor and we took a biopsy and it was incredibly difficult slash impossible to, to get a diagnosis. So locally, there were some opinions. We then got national opinions. There were other opinions. We then got an international uh, uh, reference expert to comment. They provided yet another opinion. And overall, there were various sort of permutations of something adult type uh, 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 renal cell carcinoma without being quite specific and a quite explicit notion that this didn't look like a Wilms tumor histologically. Now, the problem for him was that he had not only a tumor in the kidney, he had widely metastatic disease. And if we buy into, if we say this is renal cell carcinoma, it would mean we wouldn't treat this child because the, the traditional teaching is that renal cell carcinoma doesn't respond to chemotherapy or to radiotherapy. And therefore, in metastatic disease, there is nothing that we can do. Now, we, as a without any generic information, took a view that that's not a reasonable stance to have because there is so much ambiguity about the histological diagnosis. Uh, a bunch of, you know, the, the, a number of different, very, very, very expert pathologists could not unambiguously agree on what it was. So we treated the child as if they had an aggressive Wilms tumor. We were thankfully so really very successful. And he's doing well many, many years down the line. Now, when we got the genome back, next slide, please. It sort of retrospectively solved the puzzle. So the first thing to say is there were no markers of adult type renal cell carcinoma. And adult type renal cell carcinoma 
has almost in every case there is 3p loss and 5q gain and that's got something to do with losing the second copy of VHL and for one reason or the other it's normally in conjunction with, with 5q gain for a translocation and this was absent. The other thing is that if one looks at this genome more broadly we can now say this looks like has features of a pediatric RCC but the, the, the key thing for us was is that we found a beta catenin mutation which is not a feature of either adult or pediatric uh, renal cell carcinoma, 11P LOH, and the KRAS mutations, which are all Wilms tumor type changes. Next slide, please. And it sort of retrospectively sort of gives this tumor a Wilms tumor with, and with, with that Wilms tumor with the fact that they've responded so beautifully to treatment, uh, probably means that really this was more of a Wilms tumor than a renal cell carcinoma, going back to square one that renal cell carcinoma does not respond to cell killing treatment. This was really quite beautiful to see this. We, this is interestingly in real tumors, it's a recurrent theme now. Both we and other centers have seen that the occasional child with renal cell carcinoma who respond to chemotherapy seems to have Wilms tumor-like genomic changes. Uh, next slide, please. So next slide, please. Th this is a slightly more complex um, scenario in terms of how whole genome sequencing helped us. So this was a little girl who presented with respiratory distress and she had this big mass in her chest. Now, when we see big masses in chests in, in children of that age, we normally think of a pulmonary uh, uh, um, of a, 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 a pulmonary pleural, uh, uh, blood, uh, uh, of a PBB, which is a, is a blastoma of the lung. It's very rare, but that's normally what, what we would see in these children. We took a biopsy and the biopsy was really incredibly unhelpful in that it was just an undifferentiated tumor that had some neuroendocrine markers and some muscle markers. So there was overall, there was a feeling that this could be um, an undifferentiated rhabdomyosarcoma that expresses some funny things. However, the problem with PPBs with those lung tumors is that they can also make rhabdomyosarcomas. So we were a little lost sort of in space. We treated the child quite aggressively as we should have, and they've responded really very beautifully. Next slide. And next slide, please. How oh, strange. I have got, oh, go on, please. Next slide. Yes, so one of the things that we were able to do is, so if it had been a PPB, they tend to be most of the time associated with germline dice one mutations. Now, each of these tests, when we send them off, they take some time to come back. But here, the beauty was that whole genome sequencing immediately delivered this result to us as well. So we knew there was no germline mutation dice one which made a PPB a little less likely. Next slide, please. And when we looked at the mutational signatures, we found this. Um, on the far left is this child's tumor, on the far right are other tumors. So what mutational signatures are, are this? So when a substitution occurs, it occurs in, in a specific biochemical context, which is defined by the base after, before and after. This, this is a trinucleotide context. And certain mutational processes or certain mutagens um, uh, introduce mutations in very specific chemical contexts. And that's the basis of mutational signatures that these specific contexts we can, we can express as the base before and after. And then in many cases, we can associate them with specific mutagens and others we cannot. And the, the mathematical framework for, for turning that sort of picture that one sees into, into, into a specific signature is that uh, paper that I alluded to earlier by Mark Stratton. Um, now, there are many, many different mutational signatures. One of them is signature 18, which you can see on the far left contributed 37% of mutations in this particular child. Next slide, please. Signature 18 is a cell intrinsic mutational signature process or arises from a cell intrinsic process. It's really quite unclear what causes this, but it is not ubiquitous. The, essentially, we only found it in a few children's cancer and in the placenta. This is from one of my papers in the placenta. It, uh, it's just useful here to see the contribution of signature 18 to different childhood cancers. And what you can see on the far right, rhabdomyosarcoma is the cancer type with the highest proportion of, um, of signature 18 mutations. Next slide, please. 
So on balance, the, uh, the information helped us to say, well, this probably is not a PPB, the most reasonable uh, 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 hypothesis or diagnosis here is that it is a funny looking rhabdomyosarcomas and how the genomic features are consistent with this and very importantly with this one stop sort of uh, uh, assay we could also include exclude disodromal mutations. Next slide please. And um, next slide. And next slide. And here's a, a wonderful picture as a, as a child over here with my with my colleague Murray, and I just read out this um, this uh, 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 quote here. The test gave us a confirmed diagnosis for Aubrey after other tests had narrowed it down to one of two potential types of cancers. So that meant that the clinicians could be more confident as to the best treatment to use, and 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 that's really so very important. You know, absolutely hate giving chemotherapy to children, but giving it without a without a diagnosis is really is really a very difficult thing to do, which sadly we have to sometimes, but whole genome sequencing has helped us to resolve some of those issues. Next slide, please. So the LIFE program started in early 2022. Next slide, please. Um, we're just putting together our paper. I just wanted to, to give you a sense of how successful or not we are in, in generating data. So we've changed our approach in the 100,000 Genome Project. We obviously couldn't enroll every child, but what we said as a unit, uh, in our solid tumor practice, that we will endeavor to offer this to every child who walks through the door. In this 18 month period, we had 143 children presenting to Adam Brooks. Uh, for some of them, we couldn't, uh, to some children, we couldn't offer whole genome sequencing because either they were managed without a biopsy, and that may sound very strange to you, but there are certain tumor types where either biopsy isn't feasible or one can make diagnosis on specific clinical features and, and, and imaging features. In 20 children, there just was insufficient fresh frozen tissue. Six children were biopsied elsewhere and one child had a benign tumor, which didn't quite qualify for this. So we had 98 eligible children. In one child sequencing failed, there was a small number of children who we missed out. And the reason why we missed out is just a specific service configuration issue for us. The children with brain tumors are not admitted unless they're admitted under new surgery. And by the time they've had the surgery, have gone home, we have a diagnosis. It often takes a long time for us to have another opportunity to catch up with the children again if they don't have a malignant diagnosis but we were able to offer it to, to, to most children and got results in 90%, which I think is really quite amazing. And in terms of turnaround time, which I don't, haven't shown you here, from sending off the, uh, uh, the DNA to getting a result, that sort of varies from sort of two, three, quite often four weeks, but actually in terms of our clinical, clinical practice, most of the time it comes back in time to enable us to incorporate in our decision making. Next slide, please. And how this has helped us in real time to treat children better, we will hopefully be able to report uh, this year. Next slide. Now, the other interesting, beautiful thing that whole genome sequencing of, of childhood cancers in clinical practice has done is that it has democratized whole genome sequencing as an assay. So if a pediatric oncologist saw a couple of children who had unusual tumors and they wanted to do whole genome sequencing, that traditionally would have been almost impossible to them. The whole genome sequencing is not an easy test to do. Analyzing the data is completely not straightforward. There's huge inequity of, of access to this sort of opportunity. But now that we are generating the data for every patient, we have the opportunity to learn and it, it, it enables clinicians up and down the country to, to think molecularly about, about their patients and see what they might be able to learn. Next slide, please. I want to give you one example locally where we've taken, made a, made a finding, um, I've taken it to the lab and then back to the bedside. So what I'm showing you here is a um, cross section through the wrist of a uh, a little baby who had this weird mass, which histologically wasn't entirely clear whether it is a fibroma or just a plastic fibroma, uh, fibroblastoma, in either case a benign entity. At the time, we didn't know that, so we had performed whole genome sequencing as part of the diagnostic workup. 
And what we found is a rearrangement in a gene called uh, FOSL1. Next slide, please. Next slide. So, um, and what we've done is then, so first, it's it's quite a, this is a, a very geeky tangent, but there's this there's this family of, of uh, FOS genes, um, in, and one of them is FOSL1. I incidentally in my in my PhD research we had found that one of the FOS genes was was the, the these defining mutation in osteoblastoma. So we sort of recognize it's probably something important. So I contacted my my, my old collaborator at UCL and the, the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital in Stanmore and said, Oh, look, this is what I found. And then they went away, did a more extensive study of tumors that look either like fibromas or desmoblastic fibroblastoma and teased out that these rearrangements are highly sensitive and specific markers of this particular tumor type. Next slide, please. And um, because of our very close collaboration with, with clinical pathologists, we are then able to very rapidly introduce an immunistic chemical test into the clinic. So in, in future, then what one can do is when one suspects such a, uh, an entity and needs additional diagnostic evidence, one couldn't apply an, an, an antibody to this particular gene to show that intense staining in the diagnostic marker. So this is a really beautiful example of how we can take a sort of finding from a clinical gene sequencing effort into the lab and then back into the clinic. Um, next slide, please. So my over, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of conclusions. I think the, the key thing that I want to get across is this. Next slide, please. We should really celebrate and, and rejoice that we have got this wonderful service available to us. It is just so beautiful and fantastic that I have now got the opportunity to get an exact molecular readout of the cancer that I am treating. And it, I, I can't sort of stress enough in how many different ways on a on a day-to-day -day basis it helps us in our clinical practice and has moved us away from 90%, 80%, sometimes only 50% certainty to, to more or less absolute molecular certainty about what it is that we're dealing with. Next slide, please. And what I've presented here is not my work. It is the work of our wonderful team at Adambrooks, across pathology, clinical genetics, the Hemong hem department, and the GLH. And of course, most, most importantly, we are, we are uh, greatly indebted to our families and, and children for engaging in, in what we do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vajasi. That was actually an absolutely excellent talk as always. Um, I do have a couple of questions for you, and I'm going to start with one that's actually very closely tied to your conclusion and that celebration. I'm just going to paste it into the chat. Just give me one second. And the question is this. If you have a child with a whole genome sequencing finding suggesting a targetable sort of tumor variant and you use a specific chemotherapy for that tumor, um, who then responds but stops responding, do you then repeat whole genome sequencing to look for um, escape mutations and to look for possible alternative therapy targets? Yeah, I think that I mean that would be that, that would be a, uh, the, the way to do it. So because we can do these assays now, we've become much better at rebiopsying and and trying to understand what happens. And yes, absolutely. And there are there are examples where this has happened. And uh, this one kid in particular with a, with an NTRAP fusion, where this particular child developed two resistance mutations. So after progress resequence and then resequence again. So you're right. But but it uh, and again the the service does allow us, it's funded to, to do repeat biopsies when the disease pattern changes. So yes, absolutely. Okay, perfect. And the second one, I think, is based off the comment that you made about the beta-RAF mutations in leukemic childs, or children, rather. Um, so the question is this, do you envisage a point in the future where we do rapid whole genome sequencing for all cancers in childhood at the start, solid or hematological? and to then target therapy if conventional therapy was already started based on whole genome sequencing findings. And I think this question is targeting that sort of energy that you spoke about, where 95% of children we know respond in ALL, for example, so we use conventional chemo. Is there a drive towards sort of overcoming that as we get more experience with targeted therapy? I think that's what this question is about. 
I get your question. I do ask that question myself very often. I think it's very tumor type dependent. So in something like, you know, non-high risk uh, uh, B cell leukemia, I don't think there will ever be a point in time where it will be ethical to substitute conventional treatment with this. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe I just lack imagination, but I can't see a version of this where, where either an ethics committee or a parent would agree to, to do that experiment. However, there are other tumor types where our treatment is really quite unsuccessful. And in those situations, I think it is very plausible that we might move towards, well, let's try to target that mutation. And then there are other tumor types where, where it has, so I'll give you an example that where we do use it. I mean, one, one our NTRAC driven tumors, we can, because we can access the drugs now routinely through the NHS. That's a situation where quite often we will use uh, intrac inhibitors. And the reason is that these tend to be sort of low grade, but slowly growing and you can't cut them out type of tumors and chemotherapy doesn't work. So let's try this. And then the other scenarios in uh, our BRAF mutations in Langerhans cell histiocytosis, where we use BRAF inhibitors in combination with other drugs. I think the other thing to say is that a lot of mutation, uh, a lot of drugs that target mutations are not cytotoxic. Their site is static, and you know collectively we have the 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 impression from the limited data that is out there that ultimately yes you can stop a cell from dividing, but you also need to push it over the edge through through cell cell killing agents. Okay, perfect. And that actually you answered the follow up question I was going to ask, which is about toxicity in that case, because of course conventional therapies I imagine are much more toxic. Um, but I now see the logic from bacteria, sort of um, cytostatic they, agents they, rather than they, bacteriostatic. Um, they, they are more toxic, but I yeah. am I am genuinely scared of targeted agents because I worry that we don't understand their long term side effects. And if we go back to NTRAC, it's a really good example. So NTRAC is a neurotrophic, whatever, blah, 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 receptor tyrosine kinase. It's a fundamental gene that is required for neurodevelopment. And of course, the brain continues to develop after birth. And I, am, I, I would like to, you know, at the very least, we should question whether inhibiting NTRAC in an infant you know, yes, it may not have immediate side effects, but might end up accidentally killing really important stem cell populations, and that doesn't reveal itself until several decades later. So I am, uh, despite my my almost almost fanatical enthusiasm for for genomics and my love for genomics, and and I can see, you know the utility of whole genome sequencing. We are, we are benefiting from in all sorts of ways, but actually the mutation guided treatment is the bit that I'm the least excited about and also the one that I'm most skeptical about. I really, in my own practice, uh, I think very, very long and very, very hard before I use a targeted agent over chemotherapy. And that's something that I discuss with parents in detail because quite often the evidence, we just haven't got the experience yet. We are quite happy to use the drugs. Yeah. And I guess with that, I have come up with a following, uh, sort of another follow-on question, if that's all right. With sort of targeted therapies, you've identified a very key feature that is hugely problematic to us, um, which is we don't have any real follow-on data, especially for the newer agents. But what about sort of repurpose therapies? So I know there's a couple of tumors now where we're using sort of almost orphan drugs. Um, I can't name any off the top of my head, but there are drugs that we've used for several other conditions, and it's an area that I've worked on as well. Um, so surely in those therapies, one would be, I guess, more keen to use targeted agents, right? Yes, I think so. And and I don't want to dismiss targeted agents at all. I just want to sort of put a little bit of a nuance around how, how I think about it. And you're right. I mean, if you that if there are drugs that we have got a lot of experience with, then it becomes a lot more reasonable. But the context, again, is important. Upfront treatment for us, thankfully, is so effective. Uh, but I should also st uh, stress that in the relapse setting, most of our treatments are wholly ineffective. And in that setting in particular, obviously, it is, if, uh, if there's a mutation to target, that's what we must go for. Perfect. Um, I'm just seeing if there's any other questions posted in the chat. 
Um, I'll give it a few seconds. But I have to say it's been a really wonderful talk and a sort of really excellent run through of the earlier part of WGS leading to what we're now using it for. Um, I certainly learned a lot. I don't think anyone's posted anything else, but all I will say is thank you very much again, Dr. Vijati. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you talking with us today. Um, and thank you for actually a very stimulating discussion, certainly for myself. Um, and Hassan and thank you everybody for inviting me. Thank you. Um, and just a quick reminder, we will be sending out some feedback forms. Please do fill them out. If you fill it out, you also get a CPD certificate. Um, and please join us for our next and final sort of linkage webinar in the gene targeted therapies um, sort of story arc, which will be delivered by Dr. Ian Balfour Lynn, who's a consultant at the Royal Brompton Hospital. And he'll be talking about how the sort of treatment of cystic fibrosis has changed drastically in the last few years, especially with targeted triple therapy now. So thank you again. And I hope to see you all soon next time.